Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. I'm going to talk to Mr. Mark Shira today. Shira, uh, Mark is the co-founder of Shira Capital Group, a firm focused on curating diverse private real estate investments. As the CFO of a consulting firm and a registered CPA, Mark understands the difficulties that busy professionals like us face when seeking quality real estate. So it's pretty interesting. Mark has CPA experience. He was also the CPA of a, uh, sorry, CFO of a consulting firm. So I'm looking forward to hear his thoughts on the economy and the current environment. So welcome, Mark. Thank you, Alpesh. Very excited to be here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So this question I ask everyone, tell us something interesting or funny about yourself. All right. Well, maybe not that much interesting about me, but things that I'm interested in, at least, you know, I'm, I'm a big traveler. I love going to places like Costa Rica and Mexico. I just love warm weather, even, even though I live here in Chicago. Yeah, you're in Chicago. Uh, I'm like, of course <laughs> you would love warm weather. <laughs> yeah. So those are places I love. I love the outdoors and biking and swimming. And, and I'm hoping to turn that into a, a, a surfing someday. Although, ah. you know, midlife, I haven't done surfing yet, um, but it's it's something that I, I really want to take up in the future. So wow, that's um, that's interesting. So yeah. have you done any triathlon? Because you mentioned biking and swimming. Because I just signed up for, and I don't I don't want to announce on the podcast because I want to first do it, but I am looking to do my first try soon. I have not because uh running is not my friend. Uh okay. you know, biking and swimming I'm good at. I've done, you know, legs of okay of uh tri- you know, three person triathlon. Oh yeah, yeah, legs. Okay. Yeah, I, I hate all three and that's why I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, good so, luck to you. Yeah, you know, thank you. So that's pretty really interesting because I love hiking. I love outdoor as well. So when you someone mentions outdoor, I'm always watching, oh, can I go out? <laughs> so how did you get started in real estate? Because you are a CFO of a consulting firm. You are a CPA. What was your first foray into real estate? Yeah, so uh, I'll kind of start at the beginning. You know, I graduated from Iowa State University in 2002 and then got my CPA. And I went out into the management consulting world, worked at Ernst & Young and a couple yep. other places. And uh, about halfway through my career, one of my clients uh, basically at, started his own company and asked me to come on as his CFO. And that's what I do today. Now, meanwhile, about also about halfway through my career, I met my wife and she's a general contractor here in Chicago. And we just happened to buy a piece of land that we were going to build our own house on. And we decided to split the lot, develop two homes and and sell them as spec homes. Nice. And that's how I got and started in real estate. And, you know, from there, we, we have continued to do single family and multifamily homes um, here in Chicago. And my wife does a bunch of other general contracting work here in Chicago. But, you know, I had a busy career and I realized that being an active investor on my part was was really not feasible and I needed to seek passive investment opportunities. And so about 2016, I really got excited about uh, multifamily and, and all the very aspects of passively investing in real estate. And we did a number of syndications from apartments and uh, mobile home parks, self-storage, that sort of thing. You know, we started to talk to our friends and family about what we were doing. And they seemed to get in, you know, interested and started investing alongside of us into properties that we were investing in and operators that we were investing in. And so we realized that there really was a potential here to help other busy professionals like myself diversify from their 401ks and get some exposure into private real estate, you know, private equity outside of the 401k, that sort of thing, you know, and, and really take advantage of the true size of the market and the ability to earn some returns that were not correlated with their traditional stock and bond portfolios. And so that's, that's what we do today. So th- that's pretty awesome. One of the questions I had, because you are CPA, CF of a consulting firm, and you do private real estate investments like me, how investors can maximize risk adjusted returns by employing the tactics of, you know, top endowment funds? Yes. What, this is what something do those I've looked funds at. do? To be honest, it's it's really not magic. It sounds like magic, but it's not. And it's, it's all about diversification. These endowments don't just invest in 
401k or sorry, not for stocks and bonds. Right. Um, they're invested in things not outside cryptos? of public. <laughs> uh, they are approaching crypto oh, now, oh, right? yeah, yeah, but they would not. No. They would not be overweighting crypto yeah, yeah. in That's their portfolio. Volatile. So, you know, they set target allocations and they rebalance those allocations on a regular basis, right? Whether you're an endowment and you're doing that daily or, you know, someone else that may do it monthly or quarterly, the idea is to let your market, let your portfolio rebalance naturally, you know, so that you're not overweighting or underweighting any position. What can, you know, regular investors do. They don't have a lot of exposure to the things like private equity, hedge funds, um, you know, some of the things that endowments can do, but it is becoming approachable with a lot of these private real estate and private equity type syndications that we're talking about today. You do have to be accredited usually, but it is becoming more reasonable for investors to get some of those returns outside of the stock and bond market. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I have also wanted to talk more about real estate, of course, um, because we see that real estate it's just booming all over the country, just residential, right? Not only that, everyone wants to invest in commercial properties like apartment buildings to mobile home parks to self-storage. So what is driving such a frenzied interest in real estate investments, especially over past five years, I would say? Well, it's really the story of yield compression, right? Bonds yep. don't produce hardly anything over the last couple of years. And so investors are seeking returns on their money, right? And the next, you know, yield producing lease risk asset is real estate. And when you look at a, a real estate investment, it has a bond like and equity like component, you know, you usually get cash flow from rents, which pay right. a yield in the in the year that you're receiving those, often offset by depreciation. So tax free in many cases, or or at least the taxes are diminished or deferred. Yeah, deferred depreciation. Yep. Yeah. And then you have an equity component that usually comes when the property sells. So you have this kind of hybrid stock and bond like investment that is not correlated to the regular stock market. It attracts a lot of attention right now because it's one of the only low risk items or lower risk items that is producing yield today. Ah, uh, That makes sense. So I also see, because uh, I was also doing apartment buildings and I don't think I have an, uh, nothing against apartments. But I see crazy competition, right? The cap rates are compressing like crazy as well. And every mom and pop wants to be in an apartment building. So why and how this new real estate investors, operators, syndicators are making big mistake in today's low interest rate and highly liquid market? Is it buying those kind of assets or are they doing other stuff? You know, in my view, what they're doing is overpaying in order to be yes. seasoned operators in the market, right? Because in order to, to really win a deal, if you're a new operator with no track record of closing a deal, you have to pay higher. Yes. And so how are they doing that? They're, they're, they're probably underwriting either poorly or too aggressively on, on mm. rent increases. You know, those are the things that lead to overpaying or paying too much on a property, um, also leading to, like you said, yield compression or cap rate compression. Yes. I also think a lot of the new operators, they may not be as experienced with the local market and they may miss some of the, you know, local aspects of renters and renter bases and that sort of thing. So they may miss some things in their underwriting process. Uh, for example, underestimating the time or cost of turning a property or doing you know, renovations or what's the contractor base, those sorts of things. They also sometimes uh, under, you know, use too much leverage or use the wrong debt, you know, putting bridge financing on a property that they don't have the capacity to refinance in a couple of years if they don't meet their objectives. Um, so those are those are a few things that I think new operators uh, make mistakes on. And if you can't weather those storms, if, if there is a downturn, if you're not able to survive a downturn, then you are completely wiped out from an equity perspective. And in real estate, people who survive the downturns are the ones who thrive in the long term. Yes. And you have to be able to withstand and make it through the other end. And I believe that, you know, in a downturn, some of these new operators will see some pain. Oh, yeah. I think it's it's about time. If you don't have a solid and conservative underwriting, you are going to see uh, issues in the near future. So, of course, you have. Uh, I can tell that you are very focused on real estate and your wife is uh, also a GC. What real estate trends have you been tracking over the last few years? 
and why? Well, we talked about a couple of them, just just a lot of capital coming into the industry. You know, there's a lot of focus on passive income and financial freedom and, and those sorts of things. And then, you know, that's kind of the macro view of real estate, where things are going as far as cap rates. You know, you've got interest rates and inflation and things like that that we could talk about in a minute. But some of the other trends about the real estate market are really, you know, COVID related now. Yes. But were already a lot of them were already in place before so things like you know moving to the south for for low taxes yeah. or warmer weather to be honest correct <laughs> um you know we're moving to the country now you know the question is whether the residential market will recover in downtowns suburbs or will people continue to move you know out to the country and and buy farms and things like that right. i personally believe that the city's not dead that's where the engine of innovation and collaboration is and i think it, it will most likely come back you know offices same thing will people return to the office i think everybody's going to be looking for more flexibility but offices aren't dead right yeah, it will right. take some time to rebalance um, and find you know how that base is going to be used. Industrial is booming, right? And I see the that continuing. E-commerce, um, exactly. you know, is is taking off, and and it's still only something like fifteen percent mm -hmm. of of retail. So e-commerce is going to continue to grow. Industrial need is going to continue to grow for logistics, and I think we'll see some manufacturing coming back to the United States. Just look at the supply chain issues. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, so I think, I think there will be some onshoring of some of that to fix some of these problems. And then retail is kind of the big question mark of, you know, what's yeah. going to happen and, and where are the experiences, you know, that people desire for retail going to be, is it going to be restaurants or, or grocery stores going to be the only thing in real retail centers? I doubt it. You know, Amazon is building bookstores again. What, what, what does that mean? Right. Um, so there's a lot of question marks around retail. And then you mentioned mobile home parks, which I think are a very important foundation for affordable housing, and they may get some some attention. They've already received a lot of attention from maybe, investors, yeah, and I, a lot. <laughs> you know, I see that continuing, um, but maybe slowing down a little bit as right. the supply is capped. Right? There, yeah. there isn't a lot of supply out That's there. That's exactly and, why. And not making new ones. When the supply is capped, yeah, you will always have demand. Right. <laughs> right. Right on. You know, those are those are my views on where the real estate market is and kind of the trends that I'm following. And I think those will get those are going to keep moving in that direction. I don't see massive shifts besides what we've seen in the last year with the office. So I think we, we you may have already spoken about this, but what trends do you see unfolding in the years to come? Is there anything else other than we discussed? You know, I don't think so. The office rebalancing is important and, and retail, of course. You know, inflation is a big hot topic right now. You know, personally, I think that it's a really a short-term issue caused by the supply chains and we'll work our way out of that. I don't think that we're going to see long-term inflation and interest rate rises. And my view is, is just that the government can't afford it, right? We have too much government debt and, and the Fed will not, um, I don't think they'll allow interest rates to run too high or we will really crimp the economy, especially in this time of economic recovery. Those are my kind of feelings on inflation and interest rates. Um, we will see uh, over the next year, of course, they're not moving quickly, um, but we'll see how this inflation plays out in the coming months. Yeah, I think a couple of things, uh, which I... Uh which is just my th which are my thoughts right is one government has a pin printing press right we will not stop printing money right and second they will if it's democrat or republican none of them want to see a downturn during their presidency cycle so they'll continue to talk about economic economic recovery how long do you need the economy to recover? It's been over <laughs> 10 years. It's, it's booming right now. Stocks are at all-time high. Real estate all-time high. Crypto is all-time high. I don't understand. Unfortunately, <laughs> those, you know, the, the market is not the economy. And the economy right. is jobs and right. people working. And you know, we still have unemployment. And I think when the Fed starts to see those things moving in the direction that they want to, that's when they Take yeah, action. yeah I, I don't but, think it, it's, it's going to happen soon now that people don't even want to work. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother issue, right? Yeah. When you start throw, giving away free money, there will be a lot of people who don't need to work. <laughs> that, and that is a problem that, uh, you know, the government will have to address as well. Yeah, it, it's interesting. So let's talk about all of this from a real estate investor, right? Especially passive. What impact do interest rates, inflation, and all other economic matrices 
have on passive real estate investing? You know, just like any other good or service, real estate is driven by supply and demand. And, yeah. you know, you, you look at the new supply of new starts of housing and, and it's been impacted. It's been very low over the last decade. In fact, we've got a housing shortage, got very high pricing on housing, yeah. you know, and that's been depressed even further with COVID. So demand is going to be high. Occupancy, I believe, will be high, especially as jobs recover, people have um, more income. So, you, you know, the demand is there. And I think those, um, those metrics bode well for real estate investors. People, especially in the re residential area, I mean, you always need somewhere to live. Right. And, you know, the, the single family housing market goes up and down. People come in and out as, as they have more and less cash to, you know, purchase homes or, or finance uh, the properties that they're seeking. But, you know, you need to really look at those jobs and unemployment metrics, GDP, as a real estate investor to see how that's playing into demand for real estate, whether it's apartments, you know, industrial, mobile home parks, and where those trends in uh, employment bases are, whether they're in the South or North or East or where people are moving. And, you know, you need to be aware of which markets um, are seeing influxes and which, which are seeing outflows. I think those are kind of the big picture. You know, when I look at macro and uh, economics and what drives real estate, those are the things that I focus on. No, that, that's pretty interesting. So let's talk about uh, what you have done, right? What mistakes have you made with your own real estate investing? I think the biggest mistake I've made is, is being too concentrated in, in certain operators or certain markets, certain sectors. Uh, you know, when I first jumped in to passive investing, I really glommed on to certain uh, markets and certain investors. And then as COVID came around, I realized, you know, it was kind of a shock to me that, oh, hey, you know, one of these markets could just die or, or you know, a specific sector, apartments or, or even subsectors, Class C apartments got hit very hard. And if you were concentrated in that area, you know, your portfolio could take a massive hit all at once. And being concentrated is is really the bane of uh, portfolios. And it's it's very hard to recover from a catastrophic loss in your portfolio. And when you have concentration, you're exposing yourself to those catastrophic losses. And this is what those endowments do. They diversify to avoid massive losses in your portfolio and stay um, you know, afloat so that after a recovery or after a downturn, your base of investing dollars is, is still preserved and you can re recover much quicker. Well, that, that's great. So what are the lessons you learned and how have you applied them now? Yeah, I, so I, I think I just talked about that is, is focusing much more on diversification these days than finding the best deal because anyone can underwrite a deal that looks great on paper right. and, and you it. can do due diligence and you can go walk the property and, and you can go out and find out what the neighboring apartment buildings are charging, but that's not how it's going to play out in five years, right? Yes. No one's business plan worked out perfectly. Got it. And so, you know, to me, avoiding that concentration and overexposure to, to you know, specific sectors, specific sponsors, uh, and really focusing on getting a diversified portfolio has been my focus and, and, and really has been my lesson. Focus on the long term, not short term, you know, winning and fear of missing out on the next trend and that sort of thing. No, that's, that's awesome because that's exactly what I am doing with my portfolio. I try to diversify, again, learning from people like you that diversify uh, with the asset type, even in real estate, right? Apartments, the single family, of course, to mobile home parks and senior housing plus also diversify by the market, right? Because you don't want to put all your eggs in one market. So exactly. you, know, it's, it, 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 you can't be in Dallas, Austin, and Atlanta all the time, right? Mm -hmm. You got to see what other trends are playing out. Uh, 100%. Like that, that, that's great. And you don't want to be exposed to a place that, uh, you know, New Orleans or Houston, um, yes. you don't want to be overexposed to those where a natural disaster could uh, cut your time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, that is great. So thank you so much, Mark. Let's take a quick break. And after the break, we will go through the same questions I ask every guest. Excellent. Looking forward to it. You're listening to the Wealth Matters Podcast. The Wealth Matters Podcast. For more info about what we do, check us out at wealthmatters.com. It's wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H, matters, M-A-T-R-S.com. 
Welcome back to Wealth Matters Podcast. Mark shared his thoughts about the current environment, the inflation, interest rate talks, as well as what he learned from his own real estate investing journey. So thank you, Mark, for that. Are you, you ready for fire round? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Would you be changing any business or investment strategy after this pandemic is over? Yeah, you know, again, like, um, like I just talked about, focusing on diversification, avoiding that concentration. You know, the perfect example is uh, workforce housing, you know, looked like the darling. Yes. And, and uh, it turned out to be one of the hardest hit areas. So you just never know. Yeah. A student housing. One of the syndicator I had invested with, he had bought apartment building and converting it to student housing. Right. And, um, and this is a big celebrity syndicator. And he lost every penny of every investor. And it, and it happens. Yeah. And of course, the he best. didn't know anything about student housing. And then COVID hits. And the best underwritten deals uh, can still yeah. have problems that, exactly. that are not undercovered. Favorite real estate or finance or any other related book. And I'm pretty sure you have tons of those. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah. Yeah. I do a, a lot of reading related to real estate and economics, but I think, I think my favorite um, real estate book is, is investing in private equity real estate by Sean Cook. It's a very short and sweet playbook oh, okay. on how to uh, passively invest confidently, really. And then I got two others for you. Unconventional success by David Swenson, just on portfolio theory. He was he was the founder of the Yale Endowment and, or not the founder, yes, but I've heard about he that managed book. it. I still haven't read it, but yeah. Very good book. Uh, and then Ray, Ray Dalio's uh, Navigating Big Debt, Big yes. Debt Crisis. Yeah. Um, Ray Dalio's books, good... all, all the books are great, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing those. Sure. Any tool or website you recommend or you use, let's say when you are uh, looking at a market or a deal, uh, to underwrite or anything else? Yeah, you know, the, the big thing that I look at is economic trends. And one place that I found is great is um, there's an economic indicator dashboard by, I forget what it is, global financial something, gfoa.org. GFO. Uh, and they have a great economic dashboard that will give you 75% of what you need to know about, uh, you know, where the trends are in economic, macroeconomic. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I'm going. And then, of course, like you said, great Dalio stuff, great. Oh, yeah. The Ray Dalio stuff, uh, they're pretty, pretty interesting and very useful. This question is very important as well for all the investors. Uh, so I'm looking for, forward to your answer. Any sure. advice for beginner investors? Yes. I mean, it's, it's the same advice that probably 95% of people give, which is start early, right? First off, I, maybe five pieces I'll give. Start early learn from others. So find some mentors, learn, other, learn from others, start slow and learn fast from them. Okay. Yeah. I believe investing past with those experts will allow you to get that head start that you need and then take your time. Don't rush. I don't think uh, being a trend follower typically uh, is going to turn out well for most investors, uh, unless you have a very deep knowledge of a certain you know, aspect of investing, you know, it's much better to be diversified than it is to be uh, a concentrated trend follower, in my opinion. How do you give back? So mainly we give back financially to a couple, well, to many different, you know, organizations. Our top two are Surge for Water, who was founded by a former co-worker uh, of mine, and they help um, bring both water and sanitation and women hygiene's uh, education to uh, third world developing countries around the world. Um, and they, it, it's an amazing organization um, founded by my friend Shilpa Alva. Um, so we support them. And then I also support uh, a lot of mental health and homelessness addiction support um, through in Chicago, it's thresholds. Um, and in other places, you know, you, you can seek out your own local support for those. I think it's a, a critically important uh, service that the, the public is failing our population right now around mental health and homelessness and, and is uh, critical for, for our cities. Well, thank you for doing that. And actually, I, because when you mentioned search for water, I wanted to hear more about it. So I typed in and I already found it. Yeah, uh, I'm going fantastic to organization. It, for yeah. sure. Because I'm always looking, because of course I, I support some organizations, but I'm always looking for ideas as well. So this is great. Yep. And they have a great track record of, uh, you know, most of your investment dollars 
oh, where okay. support dollars are going out to the field. They're not uh, awesome. supporting the head office or anything like that. So right. Fantastic organization. Awesome. How can my listeners reach out to you? Sure. You can find me at uh, CIRACapitalGroup.com, C-I-R-A, Capital Group, you know, dot com. And, and from that website uh, homepage, you can download my ebook on diversification with private equity real estate. You know, learn about diversifying into real estate outside of 401k and stock market. You can do that and uh, contact, reach out on the contact page from our website. So awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Mark. All right. Thanks a lot, Alpesh. Really appreciate it. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Wealth Matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing.